Here. 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 I move to excuse uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jones and Councilmember Horman uh, from tonight's uh, workshop. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor, members of the council. We have a workshop presentation tonight on Metro District's update, and I believe we're going to start off with Ryan Stachelski. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thanks so much for allowing us to present tonight. Um, Metro Districts is something that we've been talking about for uh, a long while, and we actually had a workshop, I think it was March 8th, 2021, where we were kind of discussing um, the framework of pulling together a new ordinance um, serv model service plan and IGA, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to be co-presenting with Brad Maloney, Brian Archer, and myself, and then our um, outside counsel is Kim Crawford. She's there in black. She's our phone a friend um, because this is a highly technical um, issue, as you all know, and so we're grateful to have her um, here uh, supporting the team. Um, but with that, Brian's got the first slide, and we'll go through them. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be bouncing around a little bit uh, in the hopes to not bore you. And then ultimately, we realize that there's a really important event at 740 tonight, so we'll do our best to be done. Next slide, please. So a brief history. Um, many of you are well aware of this. I know you've read about this a lot. But um, we initially codified Metro Districts in 2007, adopted by the City Council. And we bounced around a lot on what we would allow uh, as Metro Districts. And ultimately, we ended up with the Council direction of the four items you see up there that they would construct a regionally significant infrastructure that would uh, address a city council result, that they would be located a half mile uh, within a rail stop, a designated redevelopment area, and finally meet the Colorado Green Program. And so that ran for a while and it, and it worked. Um, many of our districts were able to meet at least one of these, if not multiple um, policies. And then ultimately, as Ryan stated, uh, we're now at a period of time where we think we really need to revisit this. And so we've been working on that um, and have some information to present. So I think the next slide is Ryan. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a lay of the land, and, and this is a little bit of a refresher, um, there are currently 16 active metro districts in Arvada, and their total mills range from 10 to 90. 93 roughly um, those mills are, are um, for two uh, different purposes one is um, when they issue debt the mill levies are then collected and um, used to pay back that debt so that's the the debt mill and then there's operation maintenance and operation mills um, and you will see in our draft ordinance that we distinguish between the two and we have caps on those in our draft ordinance um, but you can um, currently in operation there are um, several districts that have those operation mills and they are um, can get uh, relatively high um, in some of the existing. Um, we're, we're showing the total issue of debt issuance by the metro districts. This is an older number. This is 2020. Um, I believe there have been a few metro districts, such as Canyon Pines, that has issued some debt since that number has been calculated. Um, but this was a good number in, in 2020. Um, likewise, we, we haven't revisited our count of how many total housing units are in metro districts since 2018. Um, that's a, a, a rough figure um, there. It's uh, gone up, but at that time, given the population and, and total number of households, roughly 13% of the city's population lived in a metro district. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a reference, uh, this is where the metro districts metro districts are in our community and even some in, in unincorporated Jefferson County. Um, you can see that they are largely in where new construction has um, been going on, uh, okay. why it's primarily out west. You can see uh, Leiden there, you can see Candela's, um, Five Parks, Whisper Creek, uh, but then you can also see Sabell's and Haskin Stations and, and a few others. Um, so just kind of gives you a frame of reference about where those are. Hey, quick question. You have uh, highlighted the Welton Lake area, the reservoir area? Yes. 
uh, we have not approved a metro district in that area. JCMD. Oh, JCMD is considered in this area? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So prior to COVID, actually I remember the last meeting, public meeting I went to uh, with Rachel Morris right before uh, the COVID protocols was uh, on metro districts and about the increased scrutiny um, of metro districts and, and those types of things. We've been seeing a lot of that and that conversation really started in 2018, 2019 and, and that's when we started really looking at our ordinance and thinking about um, what we needed to update. Um, there are um, several things listed here in terms of how is a metro district created, what are the levels of debt, those types of things. All of those are what we wanted to address while reviewing um, the metro district. So the ordinance that we're presenting is in your packet for uh, your consideration um, addresses all of these and we'll go through them iteratively here in a second. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, specifically as it relates to our um, ordinance, um, we're gonna be talking about a regional financial contribution. We call it ARI, which is Arvada Reinvestment Regional Improvement, Arvada Regional Improvement, thank you. I spaced that on Friday too, so I should have learned by then, but I didn't. Arvada Regional Improvement, um, and we'll talk about a little bit about what that is and what that means and how that could be beneficial um, to the city. Uh, increased transparency, which I think has been a lot of the conversations around it. Also accountability, what, what can we do and what can't we do as a city? Um, we're gonna talk about um, debt limits and mill uh, levy limits, and that, that's one of the things that um, can put some guardrails on what districts are able to do, and then the limit of terms of debt. Um, and, and this is, uh, applies to both um, debt that the, is issued by bonds and also uh, the private, ec private debt uh, that sometimes developers put in, and what are the terms and conditions around that debt as well. Uh, I believe Brian and Ryan have the next slide, uh, but I'm gonna let Brian kick it off. Next slide, please. So this really is to dive in a little bit deeper um, to the ARI. And one of the considerations with future metro districts is the city would have the ability um, to add additional mills on top of the allocation to help us with regional infrastructure. So today we basically have the ability to just ask for a lump sum. So we ask for a contribution towards a traffic signal or maybe an improvement in a road. But we could also add a mill levy on to lengthen out that time and give us the ability to collect um, some resources over that period of time to apply to that regional infrastructure. Um, again, these improvements would have to be part of our current plan, um, whether it's funded or unfunded. It wouldn't be something that we would just make up. Um, it certainly would be the theory behind um, new development paying for new needs. And so it's adding those mills uh, the ability to add for a lump sum would still exist. Mr. Uh, or Lisa Smith, you're first, then Mr. Marion. Yes, we, just a point of clarification on the ability to require additional mills. Is it on only new development, new metro districts, or is it if there's an existing metro district? It would have to be new, well, and I'm gonna speak, and I'm not a lawyer, so I may call for help here, but it would have to be on new metro districts that would fall under the new ordinance and the new plan. Mr. Marriott. So the question I have, in, <clears throat> I understand the, the lump sum one to, to take care of a infrastructure that helps make the development possible, but the, uh, the, an ongoing mill levy, how does that work under the Tabor laws? I mean, is the, the, the voters for, I would assume that's a Tabor issue, and are the voters for that Tabor issue only the Metro District Board or the Metro District property owners, at which time might only be a single property owner. Is that the way that works, or how do how do we do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Our phone a friend says yes. Okay. Um, the the one thing I want to add, just a, a little, add a little bit of detail to what Brian described, and he's absolutely correct. There, there's logic in having both of these mechanisms in the ordinance. Um, and it's not a you have to do it, it it's you can do it, uh, it's enabling um, through the ordinance. But for example, if you were gonna take the, the mill levy route and say, okay, in the service plan, we're gonna ask you to allocate per the, um, 
formula that's established in the uh, ordinance, um, we're going to ask you to do that because we don't believe that we have a regional improvement today that we need a lump sum of money for, and we don't want to just hold money um, for something that we're not exactly sure what we're going to spend it on. However, um, in 30, 40 years, when this debt is paid off and we're having those mills collected, then this is truly a way for development to pay its own way, not just today, but also in the future, because those roads 40 years from now are going to be long to the city of Arvada. And so towards the end of the life expectancy of the roads, that's when we're going to be collecting the bulk of the revenue from the mills. So it's going to shift from going to the metro district to the city at the end of the that time period, so then we would have um, the money to go back and reinvest in a new water tank or pump station or fixing the roads or something like that. So it allows for the, the debt to be used first up front in order to have the Metro District pay for those public improvements to install it, but then towards the end of a life expectancy, there's additional money that comes to the city in order to replace it. So that's one scenario. The other scenario relative to the lump sum scenario are things like what we're doing uh, perhaps for an example with Canyon Pines, where the city is taking on the construction of a public improvement, a pump station and piping, um, because it's gonna be part of our system and we wanna make sure that it's integrated into our operational standards and, and those types of things, and there's lots of good justification for it. But basically, we're building it, we're the project managers, we're paying the bills, but we have an IGA with Canyon Pines for them to pay us back. So they're 100% financially responsible for the construction of that pump station, but it's our project. And so that would be an instant in which you create a service plan and say, hey, we want this lump sum. So there may be a scenario in which you're asking for the lump sum because we're taking on a, uh, a metro district responsibility, but we want to do it because it's part of our system. And then we want to also incur the mills over a period of time because that thing is going to get need to be replaced in 40 years, if that makes sense. Can I ask a couple questions around that? Because I, I, I'm not, it's not comprehending for me. So you're yeah. saying that um, you're going to ask, we could add mills to the metro district, the new metro district for, well, not operating. I would assume it's more maintenance. For... So it's for the city. It, for the city, and it's established under the ARI. And that has to be spent on CIP projects, either funded that, or unfunded. That are listed. That are listed, that are city projects that benefit that district. So it's not like you could do any CIP project anywhere in the city. It has to benefit that district. And, and all of the attorneys over there will tell you you can only spend money that's collected from the district to benefit that. It doesn't necessarily need to be within the borders, but it needs to be able to show um, that it has a benefit. So in the Canyon Pines example, um, you know, there's a pump st station that we're building now. 40 years from now, you know, technologies change, things wear out or whatever. Then we would have the money to then go back in and do a replacement maintenance. So whatever. you're actually saying you want the lump sum and the mills? No. What we're saying is we have that in the ordinance that we could do that. Do both or one or the other? We could do both or one or the other. So depending on what the service plan is and the nature of what is being requested of us, that would be part of the discussion and then would be part of the approval here. Of, are you asking for a mill? Why are you asking for a mill and not a, you know, whatever, whatever conversation we have at that time. We just have the opportunity in this ordinance to do one, the other, or both. So Metro District is gonna pay more in mills so will the city commit to that metro district that they'll have an increased level of service? So because, because why is an area that doesn't have a metro district whose new development not have to pay mills or one-time charge get the same level of service than folks that live in a new district that is formed pay a mill levy for the service? So let's just, let's just hypothetically talk about sewer lines. Sure. So Candelas is a good example that's created some issues downstream, right? and there's a lift station and there's an expense, if we were to charge the Candelas residents an extra couple mils for, for the pump station and fixing the lines down line, right, down the line, we might have charged a one-time fee for that lift station and we might have charged, and we have mills to take care of the rest maybe. But then if there's an infill project that might be around the Arvada Center, like those paired homes, that may still tap into the same north line that is not a metro district, 
get the benefit of what that metro district paid for to upgrade. So how, how do you distinguish the have and the have nots when one person's gonna pay a lot more? So that's why I'm asking, are you committing the city to a higher level of service to those that are paying more money? So in that example there, the way that the North Trunk Line is paid for or uh, other of those utility improvements specifically um, is through tap fees, right? So the tap fees are what we're using to then go pay and that's their pro rata share, that's their fair share that houses in Candela's pay and that's what houses outside of Candela's pay. Relative to the pump station specifically, the pump station um, is only there, the Alkire lift station, um, is only there to service JCMD. So it's part of the JCMD 2004 infrastructure plan. And that was an obligation of JCMD because only, only houses in JCMD flow to that Alkire lift. And in fact, there's a, I'm learning more. So one metro district committed for a new metro district because there's actually three metro districts in this area. There's JCMD, Beaumont, and there's Cimarron. So, so it's JCMD interesting. JCMD is the, is the master district and then those are sub-districts from um, the master district. That are now spun off from JCMD, but were committed. Through IGAs and obligations. Yeah, so we'll come back to that in a minute, but let's okay. just, let's use a different scenario for you. Okay. Um, we approved two metro districts, one on Ward Road, the Sabells, and then we have on Ridge Road up on uh, the- Haskins Station. The Haskins Station. Um, they're contributing to an improvement on Ward Road at the intersection, both of them, right? Yes. Um, so let's just tease out the scenario if we had this ordinance when that happened. They would contribute money into that and possibly mills for the transportation impacts into the area, right? They could. They could, okay. So, so do we provide, so those two small communities contribute to the improvement of a regional system. So do those individuals who are paying into that system get a higher level of service than those that did not? So the way you gotta think about it is that, um, that that pro rata share into 52nd and Ward or, or wherever those uh, negotiated dollars were coming from that the Metro District is paying, is paying for their increase, um, it's their exaction related to the traffic study okay. so that showed that they had this impact and that's to pay to mitigate their impact. It's not just to benefit everybody, it's it's there to, it, it will benefit everybody, but it's based on their pro rata share of mitigating impacts of a traffic study. Okay, okay. so that's great from a developer's lens. Okay. Let's put a citizen's lens that's paying for 20, 30 years of one or two mill levies. They're paying the mill levies for the impact that the developer decided to do and commit that community on, that city council approved, that citizen is paying two, two maybe one mill levies, possibly mills, for 20 to 30 years, right? Is, it, is that how long the debt is? Or You could. So, it, so yes. they're paying for something that was committed by a developer, uh, that they're not getting anything benefit other than their developer made a decision that impacted traffic. So. Uh, and not, not, I'm not trying I'm to be just, I'm just telling I, I, different lenses because we got to deal with the citizens, not yeah, just a developer story. Well, yeah, but so, and I'm not trying to be argumentative, but no. the, so the scenario is that any development happens and take the metro district out of it. We are going to review that and say they never had a metro district. We're going to review that and we're going to ask for uh, an exaction in order to mitigate an issue, whether it's a traffic study, whether it's drainage, whether it's whatever it is, and we're gonna ask for that money. So that money is going to be paid for by that development some way, shape, or form. They're using the Metro District as a financing tool, but if they didn't have the Metro District, they'd finance it some other way. So it's gonna get passed along, however their pro forma works, to the end user one way or another. It could be an increased home prices, and then your house is $50,000 more, and then you're putting in your mortgage. So one way or another, somebody has to pay for that in order to mitigate the uh, challenge that was identified through the development process because we don't want to put that burden on everybody else and then have every other taxpayer kind of put the bill. That's development not paying its own way. That's the opposite, uh, making the rest of the city pay for an impact that, sorry to pick on Haskins Station. 
great product. <laughs> um, Haskin stations or, or Savelle's or, or another development had. Does that make sense? I mean, it makes sense, but I'm not sure I'm quite there with you on, on, on that, but I'm sure we can go through it some more. Yeah. I, 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 just, I just think that the lens in which you're looking through is very good about getting the development to a green light to move forward, but I'm more worried about the debt that the future citizens are gonna have to shoulder on something that is right now, what you're explaining, is not well defined. So if the improvement, let's just say for example, the scenario was the improvement of that intersection was $5 million and they are only gonna contribute a million to it, but we're gonna do mills to pay that debt or to replace it after the life of that asset, right? Sure. Because that, you're riding on those mills on those, on those citizens to replace the asset when it fails after it's been replaced by the initial investment from the development. In part, but it's only their pro rata share. It's their impact, not the entire project. 20 years after the light's no longer good, the intersection needs to be rebuilt, you're saying they're gonna do a pro rata, but you're gonna charge a mill on a pro rata? So what we're doing is the, the fees and the numbers are defined early on by the cost that's defined in the service plan of what that share is. So it, it's defined at the beginning of what that cost is gonna be. Again, okay. uh, again you, this is something that can be discussed. So unless it's, you know, if, if we bring a service plan to you and we say, hey, we're gonna collect the mills, we're not exactly sure what we're gonna use it for, and you say, you know, I don't like that because, you know, I don't want the city to be collecting money uh, that we don't know what to use it for. But if we come and we say, hey, we're going to um, collect these mills, and we think that in 20 years, in 30 years, whatever, sorry, um, in 30 years, um, we need to replace X, or we need to build this tank, or and it's gonna be on the city's cost, but it's this development that's being impacted for it, then that may, that may make sense. Again, these are just options that are available in the service plan, these are not requirements, and each service plan is going to be unique. Okay. And approved by city council. And approved by city council. Right. Yeah, so, but I mean, the only thing I'd say, Mayor, is, is uh, if uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I think I wish we were more aware of the rearview mirror after we approved them um, than we're dealing with. And, and I appreciate what the team's doing to put it together. So we'll finish through the presentation. But I also don't know if city council's fully informed. I'm talking beyond us. When we're gone in five, ten, who knows, do we remember um, or is the team clear about those impacts? Um, and we can talk about it at the end of the uh, workshop of the feedback from the citizens that I deal with. Sure. It's, it, this is all I hear about is the complaining of the mills. Understood, and, and actually that's a great segue. It's a good segue to the, to the next slide. Which would be Brad. Which is actually Brad. Okay. <laughs> <Run away. laughs> Your Honor, Council, good evening. Um, my slide is supposed to be the yes, next one. Yes, Kevin, right? next slide, your slide. Right. Thank you. So uh, two of the items that I'm gonna discuss are, are uh, the transparency and the accountability provisions that are built into the ordinance and the model service plan. Uh, much of this uh, lifting as far as transparency was actually taken on by the state legislature last year, um, but our ordinance, uh, actually the model service plan itself, uh, puts in place uh, various different things that a uh, metro district would need to have on its metro district website. Um, so that a lot of the questions that citizens sometimes have is how, how do I even get a hold of the people that are associated with this so-called metro district that I've been living in. Um, and so uh, this gives some information about the metro district that's readily accessible and also has uh, some information associated with how timely it needs to be updated. That's basically what I have on transparency. If you don't have any questions, we can go to the next slide. You may proceed. And uh, the ordinance itself also discusses the idea of accountability. Um, this is not uh, an uncommon uh, listing of items. What's frequently done whenever there is a material deviation from the service plan uh, that council is not okay with, uh, we could basically file for an injunction uh, to stop it from happening. Uh, this ordinance also allows uh, for uh, additional items such as withholding permits and approvals and basically uh, secures that we could have any type of remedy that would be allowed by the state, which is 
pretty much the injunction, or if we have uh, a violation of the IGA, we could end up having like a breach of contract type of uh, claim uh, as well. That's what I have on accountability. On, on this whole issue, a thought comes to my mind. I, I understand where, where Mr. Pfeiffer is coming from in terms of people, frankly, not being fully informed as to what their long-term costs are going to be. You know, back in, back in the day when people bought houses out at Westwoods, they had to sign a little disclosure form that said your house may get hit by a golf ball, right? Is there a way and, you know, just to have a disclosure form that's signed by potential homeowners that says this is what your initial, you know, we've got the bold print that's always on this. You may be part of a special district or a metro district. You should look into that. Well, frankly, I don't think a lot of people do. Um, but could we actually have a document that says this project is going to have X number of mills and you know, factor in, based upon what your house costs, this is what your annual cost is gonna be initially to, to make sure that people really know what they're buying into. Yes, sir. We built in uh, basically the idea of having a model notice that uh, council would be able to uh, agree is uh, in compliance with the model notice. Um, and, and so if, if it is not, then that would be an issue that uh, the council could choose to disapprove uh, of that notice and uh, then. But would that notice include that information as to this? I think it does. It, it, yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. If I may, when does that notice come out to the homeowners? Because the last thing I want is something buried on page 106 of the closing agreement when people are just signing, signing, signing. I want them aware of this at the front before they become invested into the idea of a particular property. Yeah, I don't know if we, we haven't, we haven't secured a way or figured out a way to uh, require uh, pragmatically have notice go out uh, before the closing time uh, on, a, on a house. Um, so I don't know. I almost think it ought to be prior to, as part of the initial contract for I, purchase of the property. I would agree with this. Okay. And so, I mean, we're, this is why we're having the workshops. So right. We can end up uh, looking at some additional items, so we can definitely take that one back and see if, 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 it's, if it's even possible. feasible. You know, I mean, I, you know, I understand that this is a financing tool that the development community uses, and it may be appropriate, but you know, we don't want things hidden from the eventual buyer. That you know, it's almost like giving them the option: pay X number of dollars more for the house. Because I go back to to what. Ryan said, because I think he's exactly right, You're, you know, th these are fixed costs that, you know, pay me now or pay me later um, that, that are going to happen on, on any project. Um, and is there an option for the, for the home buyer to say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pay the extra X number of dollars for the purchase price of the house to pay my fair share of this um, or pay it over time, so. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer. No, that's a good point, Mayor. I mean, so let, let's just walk through a scenario that I hear all the time. The scenario is uh, I bought this house for five, well, this day and age. Back in the good old days. Mm -hmm. But let's just use rounded numbers. But let's just say $700,000. I bought it. And then um, I close. I will tell you the title company uh, highlights these special districts, but do not call them out. Mm -hmm. And my mortgage which I, I'll, I'll pause, my mortgage lender was in the room and said, well, let's stop right here. Let's be very, very clear. These are the mail levies in your house. You are in a, you're in a metro district. And oh, by the way, we're gonna proactively uh, do an escrow account because we know your only land value right now and we're gonna put the house mortgage. Now, granted, I, I used a very large bank that was very proficient in this. And so it didn't bite me in the butt like some of my neighbors where nothing was said. And so, the issue becomes is, wow, I bought a house for $700,000, but oh, by the way, I'm paying $15,000 in taxes a year. I don't think people understand. That's an operating expense that's taken out of the household of $15,000 for that. So that's where I have an issue because there's nowhere in there. Now, if I bought the house for $900,000, like he said, and I had paid no mill levies, I know what I'm buying. I know I'm paying seven or nine hundred thousand dollars for it because I know I'm buying into that. I know the price, but here it's at, oh seven hundred. I saved money, but I got a fifteen thousand dollar bill where other other communities are paying, and even in the city, are paying only a couple thousand dollars a year. 
So the, yeah, the citizens out west are pissed because they're getting a bill that's four times more expensive than the neighbors that are not in a metro district. And so that is a problem. And I don't think saying, let's let the title company call it out or, or anything, that is not gonna work. There's gotta be a different notice that gets clearly documented in a separate page that says, this metro district is gonna be charging 77 mils for this term, for this long, this is how much it will cost over the time of your loan. I'm not talking to you, but the group. No. I'm just looking I at understand. you because you're in front of me. I'm here. Yeah. Um, you're just a target right now. Lawyers and, can take it. Yeah. And I, he, uh, yeah, for more than a decade. Let's and, go. And just, and just so it's disclosed and, and they sign on it, I kind of like the Jefferson Parkway of what we did. We called that out. Uh, rec, rock, it's interesting. The Jefferson Parkway had its own signature in the, in the closing, and so did Rocky, uh, Rocky Flats. You had to disclose that you were living next to Rocky Flats. But the mill levies of 77 mills, which is glazed over, luckily my mortgage person called it out. Um, I knew it because I went in blind. Like I knew what the situation was, but I acted like, hey, let's go through the process. Let's see what a citizen goes through. Let's just pretend like I don't know anything. And I realized through that process, there is a lot of failures in explaining what a metro district is. To this day, people still think it's an HOA. And then, like, why? I, why? I'll pay my $250 a month. Where do I pay that bill? No, I actually have in our community folks that are paying not only HOA fees, they're also paying the 77 mills. It, 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 you're talking now $20,000. People are going to foreclose over tax debt than it is on the mortgage of the house. So where did we really deflect the problem? Because the, to me, the problem is, is fine, I, I, I thought I got a cheap house. And I got closed, I, I, I foreclosed on my house because my tax debt got too high because I didn't understand that. We've got to be very, very, very clear on, on this, this tool that is being used. And I don't know how we're going to overcome that because that is, that is an area I'm going to have a lot of concern with. Um, I, and I appreciate the mill levy discussion, um, but like transparency and accountability, I will tell you this is developer driven when it first gets going. It's fox in the hen house that creates debt by whatever mills that they project they can do, that's an open credit card for them to do what they want. The problem I've shared with some of the folks that are in the audience is they accrue operating expense before revenue comes in. And guess who gets straddling the operating expense debt? The, the community does, of future residents. So when you get into accountability and transparency, I, I don't think we've done enough. There needs to be some representation there Right now you have no citizens that live in it, but yet you gave the checkbook to somebody to just open up mills and start collecting debt without any checks and balance. So either we need to have teams or staff in, in uh, part of that board, or I will volunteer, I think a, com a council member needs to be sitting on those boards to, to give some governance to represent the people that will soon be living in there and acquiring that debt. Um, because I, don't, I, I can tell you my experience with Beaumont and Cimarron has not been very good at all. It's far from perfect probably the extreme of the other side. But there's, there's been no checks and balances. And then there's no warranty work associated. So when you talk about accountability and transparency, the warranty and checks and balances, well, it's the developer checking themselves to see if they did the landscaping right. They just write the check. They don't live here. They don't, they don't understand. So how do we close that gap before citizens are on the board? You know, I know some HOAs, or excuse me, uh, metro districts get citizens on that board fairly quick. But I also know some take 10, 12 years to put a citizen on. Meanwhile, they're accruing debt. So how do we fix that from, from a transparency and accountability? Any thoughts, or is that something we should go back to the drawing board? Well, what's that? Yeah. But With, so the, there's, there's, an, there's, an, there's a lot there. So <laughs> um, we're going to try to take it uh, a piece at a time and, and talk about um, some of those things. Um, the last thing that you said, though, and, and I may uh, phone a friend on this, um, in terms of the transparency, uh, in terms of when a citizen can be on the board, it's as soon as that they own property. So um, savvy or citizens that are aware of it have the opportunity to run for the board and, and be elected earlier on in the process than a lot of them are aware of. And so that can be part of the transparency thing. Hey, you own land in this metro district. Do you know that you're eligible to be on the board? This is why you 
want to be on the board. Getting to some of your, so that, that could be something, and, that, and that's part of ordinance now. That is something that's allowed now. There's just not a lot of people running to be on metro district boards. There's just like, there's not a lot of people who generally want to be the HOA president. It's a tough job, let's just say that. Um, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Well, and, and that even highlights the point. You can't even get people to volunteer for an HOA board, let alone be elected, elected to right. a metro district. I don't think folks, one, understand that, and two, when they do see that it's an election, it's a true an election, Right. then they kind of get scared. Sure. So then people won't. I, I don't know what successes Leiden has versus what Candelis has had and the others. Um, you know, but from, from my experience and observations and discussing with some of the community members, it hasn't, it hasn't been that way. And I think that is a problem. And I don't know how we enforce, oh, yeah, they have a website. Well, yeah, everyone puts a website up, but are they keeping it up to speed? Well, the, and the website it has the obligation to put the mills and what it's being used for in the service plan. Now, I, you know, you can lead a horse to water, I know, right? I know. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts in terms of personal people's private actions about what they should do or could do and what is our role in order to make them do it. So what we want to do is we want to provide an ordinance that drafts everything so that the metro district has that information out there. And we can push them and we can ask them in, in different ways so that it's on the broker sheet for any sales within a, a neighborhood or things like that. Whatever we can write into a, a, a service plan to obligate them, so hey, make sure you look at your mills when you're looking at the listing, not even at the, mm -hmm. uh, the purchase agreement, um, but even prior to that because, you know, anyway. Um, so what we can do is we can try to push notification earlier and then we will always have, and it's an obligation, that they have to have the true information out there of what the mills are, what it's gonna cost. There'll probably be a formula because it impacts everybody differently in terms of your housing value. And the other thing, you are absolutely right because because the assessor is a two year delay in terms of land value versus the improvements that are on there, people see their initial um, tax bill and they're like, oh, that's not bad. And, and that's what they're getting disclosed and they have no idea that when they put $600,000 of assessed value onto that $200,000 piece of land, um, what that does to the number and it changes it quite a bit. Yeah, I, I, let's highlight that. I mean, it, it was an $1,100 increase per on month. your mortgage. Your mortgage. And yeah. luckily, you know, when your escrow is covering that, that's fine. But, you know. Well, you're covering it. You put yeah, it in. Yeah, I covered it. I covered it yeah. and got proactive about yeah, 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 yeah. it. But, but the Joe Blow does not always see that. So when you only see the value of the land of $30,000 or whatever, right. and you're paying taxes on that, it's, it's, it doesn't seem unusual because it, it seems very matching to if you lived anywhere else in Arvada. But then, you know, two years later, all of a sudden you're warned that you're going to add another, you know, um, 15, 000, uh, up to $15,000 possibly in total uh, taxes. Understood. It, 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 we've got to figure out a different way of saying it because I think one thing, I don't think folks understand what a metro district are. And in the light of just the most recent election that I went through with them, you know, it's a full citizen board now. but you know, it was very apparent that folks do not understand what a metro district is and what they're doing and how to deal with the debt and why do I have $180 million worth of debt? You know, they don't, they think, what the hell, the HOA just went crazy and built a golf course? You know, uh, they don't understand where that debt comes from. So Understood. we've got to figure out a way from a city perspective as well as how to educate our citizens, but you know, a different way and, and what metro districts are. And, and how and, the debt is acquired. And, 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 and that's fair. And, and that may be some things that the, we can do on the city side, independent of the ordinance, of just what is a metro district. So, you know, we, we have plans that we want to have a web page on the city's thing of, of discussing what a metro district is. Where do we find the list of the 16 metro districts? How do we link to those uh, websites? So there's, there's things that on the city side that we can be doing about education about what a metro district is. But again, People need to read it, people need to understand it, people want to, need to want to get into the weeds because this is a extremely complicated. Um, well, and, and like this, I don't know how we get where JCMD wrote a service plan and then all of a sudden Cimarron is a sub plan and then he, uh, uh, to implement the capital and then they created Beaumont to create the financial arm yeah. and then JCMD spins them off 
And then now Cimarron is spending all the money, Vomont's collecting all the money, but now Cimarron is sunsetting, and now Vomont's taking on everything. How do you get in <laughs> one area, one planned area, three metro districts with shuffling? That should not be allowed either, because how confusing would it be for us in council that we approve three metro districts for the same properties? So, right? I, and just to throw a monkey wrench in there, I think that there's six metro districts. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just for Don't fun. Don't even tell me. Okay. I think these you have filings probably mixed in there as well. No, no, no we're not talking about uh, filings because we're talking about um, Canyon, Pines. Canyon Pines, we're talking about Shadow Mountain, we're talking oh, about JCMD yeah, 1, yeah, JCMD yeah. 2, Beaumont, um, Cimarron, um, and there's probably one or two other names that I'm forgetting right now. But all of that is, and I'm not the legal expert, so, but all of that is done first with the first metro district, so JCMD, which was created a long time ago, and then they had a certain level of debt limit. And they said, there's an infrastructure plan that needs to happen with this debt. And those are kind of the two big component pieces to it. This is how much money I have, and this is what I need to build. And then they made a sub-district, call it Beaumont or, or, or Cimarron, and carved off a piece and said, you can have some of that debt, and you can have some of that um, infrastructure plan that you have to build with that debt. And they repeated that story several times, and everybody got their kind of share of the debt limit capacity and what they had to build. And JCMD, with their leftover uh, debt allocation, had to build some of the uh, master infrastructure, like Candela's Parkway, or certain traffic signals, or some um, utility lines, or water tanks, and those types of things. So all of those things are in a web of agreements that poor Brad, like his first week, had to read like a thousand pages of stuff, and we're like, welcome to the city of our path. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, exactly but how it started. <laughs> in COVID. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I digress. But so not, not to... Uh, Go any further into the weeds on that, but but let's. That's how it I happened. think we can highlight that as a scenario of transparency and accountability because in that scenario there was a lot of shuffling the deck chairs, and when you try to go and figure out how debt was accrued and how it was diced and how it was spun off and how it was collected and how it winds there, it's a core of nightmare. You cannot yeah. connect the dots for the life of any regular citizen to understand. How did JCMD figure out what debt to get to, to Cimarron to, to, for Beaumont to own? And it, it, we, we need to figure out a better way when we talk about accountability and trans, uh, transparency about how do we put more guards around something like that. So your points are very valid um, with the debt structure. And part of what we're asking with this new ordinance does put additional requirements on debt. Um, specifically developer debt, but also broader debt that um, the city wants um, certification of external financial advisor, and we're hoping to be able to track that. Now, they do a lot of that now anyway, um, but certainly what you're speaking to years and years and years ago, a lot of that didn't <coughs> exist. Or when they did it, we didn't necessarily get copies of it and, and that kind of a thing. So, so hopefully I, we can close some of those gaps through this new ordinance. That's exactly what we're trying okay. to do. Okay. One of the, uh, one of yeah. the. Can I break it? Yeah. So uh, this is I'm Kim Cropper. Thank you for having me tonight. But some of your issues I, I agree are completely valid, but they need to be addressed on a statewide level, because we can't, Arvada can't change state law, state real estate law. It kind of has to be, um, the same for everybody. So you can't have stricter real estate laws than. I mean, you can have requirements, other other requirements, but when when you get to the to the signing office and you're signing all your documents, that's that's state law. So you can have different disclosure, and you can have things that you can put on your website that say, maybe here's a calculator. You put in the price of your house, and you assume 50 mils, and you can calculate how much that mill is going to be or how much you're going to have to be paying each year. But but you can't make people read that, and you, know, you can certainly require this additional disclosure, but I think if you're going to require things above and beyond what the state law and the state real estate examiners require, that might be problematic. We have to, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a real estate lawyer, I'm a bond lawyer, um, but I do know that there are some issues with real estate law that we have to be careful of if we 
if we start kind of going, dipping our toes into that. And, and what do you mean by that exactly? I mean, we can always say no to metro districts. That's an easy way you of saying absolutely. it. Absolutely, you absolutely can. Um, and with your, your issue with sub-districts, you can prohibit sub-districts. You can say you, you can't form a sub-district. So you, Candelas, can't, you know, say this little piece is gonna be a different sub-district and we're gonna have a different mill levy for this sub-district. We're just, we're just not gonna allow it in our ballot. You, you can do that. Okay. Because on these sub-districts, did they ever get approved through us? I don't know. Probably. I, well, I don't know. I remember sure. one, I think, came when I was here, but I, I don't mean, remember typically, the typically, and I, I haven't looked at your prior service plans, but typically that's required. And then these sub-districts can impose a different mill levy um, and an additional mill levy than what the other districts have. Yeah, so maybe that's part of the discussion is sub-districts or not. Maybe I need to know the pros and cons with that. Okay. Uh, just the two items that I had on, on that as well is just uh, we, we do have an attachment for the model IGA that has uh, uh, basically a notice, it is the model notice, that would say based on a property sale of fill in the blank, your anticipated extra amount of taxes to pay because of the special district is fill in the blank. So I mean, it does it does attempt to go for the va uh, you know cover the valid point the, of the newly developed property, right? Like the the properties that have been around for years, the concern is significantly less. Um, you could uh, you can go into any of the real estate apps, right? And they'll end up showing you when you're looking at a listing exactly how much the property taxes were from the prior year. It, it, you know, you, could, you can tell just based on that alone that in comparing properties that one has a significantly higher amount of property tax than another. But your point is, is very valid associated with that doesn't do anything for a new build or yeah, for something field, that's just a couple. It becomes of, a problem. Yeah, so uh, we'll we'll look more at this model notice and, and see if we can end up uh, coming up with some additional ideas for transparency on that as well. There, there's one other thing that I wanted to add relative to sub districts, and it's in this ordinance as well. And if I get this wrong, Kim will correct me. But what I believe it says is that um, you can't have two districts on top of each other that do the same thing. So um, if you were going to have a sub district or uh, carve off a portion of it, or let, let's say somebody wanted to put a metro district on top of JCMD to build utility infrastructure. That can't happen. So the it, JCMD and Vomont, for example, can't be doing the same thing with two different buckets of money uh, to accomplish the same goal. You can't be redundant in that way. So if, if you did have overlapping, so the point is that Cimarron and Vomont have their pro rata share that it's their responsibility for their kind of section and whatever associated regional improvements like a contri contribution to the lift station or something like that. But you can't have another metro district come on top of it or even JCMD come on top of it and build Candela's Parkway twice, for example. I think that scenario probably won't, hopefully won't happen again because Beaumont was tasked to collect revenues and Cimarron was tasked for improvement and operating. Right. And so they weren't collecting. What caused confusion was the bill came from Beaumont, you know, and the citizens see that Cimarron's spending the money and they didn't understand why they're writing a check to Beaumont to their taxes, but yet Beaumont's not spending it. They're just transferring lump sum over to another metro district. And so I think we need to just be careful around sub-districts and what they're used for and eyes wide open. Next slide, please. So when talking about mill levies, the model service plan does include limitations. So you'll see that the initial debt limitation is 50 mills. Uh, initial operations limitation is 10 mills. Um, they're exclusive of each other. So obviously you could start off with 60 mills. Pretty sure the debt limitation is also Tabor adjusted. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, Tabor, Gallagher. Gallagher. Yeah, Gallagher-ish adjusted. Ultimately, that's why you'll see some areas that have greater than 50 mils because they're trying to keep that amount of revenue uh, flat or what it was growing. Um, the repayment can go no longer than um, 40 years, but ultimately no longer than the life expectancy of the asset. 
So that's something we wanted to make sure we got in there. And then we did put additional conditions on developer debt, um, which Councilmember Pfeiffer is in reference to what you were talking about is contributions uh, by the developer before even the, the shovels hit the ground and, and how that gets repaid. And so reading directly from, from the plan, it basically states that um, the district shall obtain and provide the city with certification of an external financial advisor that states that the interest rate is reasonable, um, that the criteria is appropriate and it's comparable to other securities, and ultimately uh, we won't allow any compounding. So ultimately if the repayment doesn't start for a period of time, we're not allowing you to add the interest on top of the principal and then recalculation on, on top of that. So. It's a good move because 9% Beaumont's paying on the operating debt. Yeah, I know they, the they paid uh, any, uh, anywhere as low as 7 and as high as 10 um, throughout their lives. Um, certainly 8 or 9% today may not seem so bad, but when you had interest rates at zero, that seems awfully high. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. The other thing that he's saying is if it's still on the books after 40 years, it automatically goes away. So does the Metro District stay, or is it, will it sunset ever? I guess it's hard to say. I guess it depends on the service plan. I guess well, it, it also depends not, on your operations. If it's an HOA or, because right. it could operate like an HOA. Yeah, well, yeah, your operating mill levies could continue forever. But your debt would end yes. after 40 years max. Um, next slide. So we talk a little bit about what we did from a community perspective, and I think Ryan can jump in here. Um, but the documents were sent out to, as you can read up there, 122 developers and Metro District Attorney, 70 opened them. Uh, we had a comment period for 30 days. We did receive comments from three uh, different members, um, mostly minor, some, some very good points that uh, obviously we're trying to learn together and so we'll definitely look at incorporating those. Um, and then we do obviously have some developments that uh, would like to continue. And so um, we are asking for direction and would like to come back to you um, before August for final approval so that um, if these districts decide to move forward they can make a November election, we would like this to be on the new, the new model service plan, the new ordinance. Okay, so my question on the November election the electors in those elections would just be the property owners, right? Which initially is just the just developers. Just the developers, that's correct. So those elections always pass. It, <laughs> Hopefully. And, and it's, it's electing the body, right? And you have right. to be a property owner and usually there's only a handful. Right. Um, so yes, they are always gonna pass. pass and with the, the people who um, want to be on the board. That is true. But as soon as you have a different property owner, they're eligible to run for election, and I believe it's three-year terms, or oh, four years, I'm sorry. But the initial provisions yes. of the service plan are going to be adopted and approved by the initial board, I assume. Well, well actually, Actually, the, prior to. Prior, right, because right. you can't have the election until the service plan. And it's been it, approved. Uh, correct. Right. So really, it's when it's designed and developed with the city council as to what are the guardrails of each district. Right. Yeah, that's what we've got to be careful on. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this just lays out, um, we're getting feedback tonight. Um, we have three documents in front of you. It's the ordinance, the model service plan, and the model IGA. Um, you know, based on your feedback, we'll go in and take a look. In order to meet um, kind of that August time frame, um, we would want to do first reading on June 27th and public hearing on July 18th. But that is uh, subject to your direction and, and making sure you guys feel confident that we are at a place where we could do that. Yeah, I got an email today from somebody concerned about this. I'll forward it on to you so okay. that you can see what that input sure. is. Uh, Lisa Smith. So I saved a bunch of my questions so you didn't get peppered like Mr. Pfeiffer over there. Uh, so bear with me here, but what would you say is the main point of a metro district? 
It's a financing tool that allows you to amortize public improvements over a longer period of time. It's similar to what we're doing with bonding for our infrastructure, where it's difficult to come up with the cash up front in order to do that. And so this basically allows you at hopefully, be, mm -hmm. hopefully favorable rates when you get into the bond market that you're out, uh, allowed to take uh, things that cost a lot of money and pay th for them over time. And it's supposed to be, for, I mean, it is for public improvements only. That's the scope of uh, metro districts. And I think that there are nine different public improvements, but you can negotiate some in and out of those um, in the service plan, but that's what it's for. And then you can have the operating and mill to, um, because some things will never be a city asset like uh, detention ponds and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so you have to continue to clean those and maintain those. Right. And so there's operating mills that are associated with that. So is there any intention of a metro district to make some of those homes being built more affordable? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, I, I believe that those, so the metro district is really in charge of the public improvements that are, um, it's a quasi-governmental organization. So I, I don't want to equate them necessarily to a city, but they have certain specific roles that are just putting in those infrastructure. They have an interest to try to do things um, in a most economical way in order to build that infrastructure. We can argue whether or not they yeah. choose the right contractor or not, but their obligation is really towards the public improvements. The builders that they then go on to sell those pieces of land to may or may not be um, interested in the affordable housing component piece mm -hmm. to it. Um, and all of these things are component pieces to what is the cost of development? Mm -hmm. So the cost is gonna be the cost of building that road and putting in that sewer pipe and those types of things and you wanna do it as cheap as possible, but the metro district isn't going to subsidize the house yep. or something like that. Okay, these are gonna be quick. Just the, the option for us to take both, having mills and lump sum seems quite aggressive to have versus maybe uh, shifting it up and allowing them ha to have an option of which route they want to choose instead of us demanding both. It just seems aggressive to ask for both. Um, so that's just one of my feedback points. The transparency component, I'm wondering, is there a third party contact or organization that was established from the legislature, uh, legislature last year that if there is issues with metro districts, is there a governing body or a nonprofit or anything that can work with disputes or issues? Well, there is stakeholder in that they have, I, I mean, uh, if you're saying if a citizen is right, if the there are citizens district, that are saying, you know, complaining about the metro districts, the boards, is there a third party entity that can help? Not, not really. The, the division of local government also um, is where kind of the depository of all special district information. Um, under state law, special districts have to file certain information with the, the division of local government annually, and they have to report election results. They have mm -hmm. to supposedly, you know, again, have transparency that they need to post. So if you go on their website, you should be able to, to you know, find information. It's not mm -hmm. always as easy, but they do have that there. Um, you know, I, th I think if you wanted to go to a state agency like that and just ask if there's complaints, but I think, unfortunately, you're, you're the city that approved the service plans. They probably come to you. You don't necessarily have any control over them um, because they are a quasi-municipal you know, government mm -hmm. and political subdivision of the state. So, so they um, act independently. But if you do have property owners, just like with the city, you can vote your directors out of office and you can have recall elections. You can um, do things that you, you can do in any normal, mm -hmm. normal, a normal government. But um, Okay, thank you. Um, the other, um, adding accountability. Is there a way that we can incorporate some sort of fee if they are not holding up to their end of what they're supposed to be doing? Because I didn't see that anywhere in there. So we do, uh, we, we do have a scenario where we're, we're looking at as far as recovery of attorney's fees um, and costs that are associated with um, our uh, pursuit of, uh, of holding them accountable uh, for some sort of material deviation from the service plan. Um, but that's kind of, th that would likely be uh, the, uh, I think that we also, put, I, could, I guess we put in one other cost structure, I think, associated with it. 
um, as well. So I can I can look at that again. But that's really kind of where the, our limitations would would be. And that cost is probably going to fall back onto the homeowners. Yeah, this isn't their money. Mm -hmm. So I mean, to to, to Bob's well-articulated point, this isn't their money. They're just controlling it. So any addition mm -hmm. of fees is being passed along That's to homeowners fair. anyway. I think the biggest um, uh, teeth that we have in this is um, the ability to withhold building permits. Um, because at the end of the day, what, what they need to do is they need to sell lots and build homes or, or I mean, because this can apply to commercial as well. So wh whatever type of development they're developing, they're, the biggest stick that we have is related to the permitting process. Got it. And to Councilmember Pfeiffer's point about the warranty, have we, are we going to look into how we can make sure that the stuff is actually quality and maybe holding some amount back or I don't know what? So there's a, there's a couple things. Um, so we have escrow ordinances related to public improvements and depending on who's building them, um, we uh, take escrow for that. So th there's it's a complicated answer. We do have a warranty process in which um, uh, we go out and we inspect. I will tell you one of the biggest challenges to our warranty process is it being phased over time or developments being phased over time. So when you're doing Candela's or you're doing Wyden Rock or, or, or something like that, and even if you have different filings, I mean, um, Bob lives in a filing that has like three sub filings. Um, so it gets mm -hmm. even, so like what you wanna do is, you know, you want your curb gutter and sidewalk to be good. You want your roads to be good. You want this, that, you want your storm drains to be cleaned. Um, but those are hard to keep clean when construction is ongoing and when you have that construction traffic. So you might have this road in which all the houses are built or maybe 80% of the houses are built, but then they come in and they build two more and the contractors come in and they drive over the curb or they do this, that, and the other thing. Um, and so your warranty period is already over because it's been past two years and now you're just kind of doing this thing. So the, the, the phased approach to development on the scale that some of these projects are is challenging because we do inspect, we do do the warranty and we do hold them to making sure that that stuff is installed correctly. It's just after it gets installed, people go and jack it up. Got That's it. a technical term. <laughs> Last question, board structure. Is it possible in our service plan to have any say in the board structure, meaning if we wanted to have some third party, nothing? It's an election, so. But, mm, okay. It's, it's but dictated the, by state okay. law. State thank, law. thank you. Mr. Marriott. Thank you, <clears throat> a couple questions. So the, I wanna start off with this premise of the we allow metro districts just for kind of these four articulated reasons, um, the one that most seemingly is, is uh, used as this regionally significant infrastructure kind of argument. How do we, how do we, f and, and that's for us even allowing a metro district, but metro districts can do regionally significant infrastructure, but they can also do enhancements for the development itself, for the, for the, for the residents itself. How do we justify that that allowing metro districts only in the case of that regionally significant infrastructure or green building or proximity to rail or you know some of those things we articulated but seemingly don't allow a metro district if it's just for enhancements within the development itself so those four items were are what's in our current ordinance mm -hmm. we are not carrying them forward into oh, we're the not. new ordinance okay. so I the new ordinance doesn't specify it's more general language that says it's in the best interest of the city. Okay, so let me give you a hypothetical. If a developer comes and says, we'd like to do this development, we'd like to have a metro district to do the, the underground infrastructure, but we'd also like to have a really nice clubhouse and pool. Sure. Um, and will you allow a metro district there? The city council has the ability to allow that or not allow that then. That's correct. So there, there would be no, guidance that only if you're also building the traffic light, you know, a block over or something. So those, those provisions before, I believe, were in the whereas causes, mm -hmm. um, where it j gave general guidance to when the ordinance was drafted in, I believe, 2007, or approved in 2007. So those were the general feeling at the time, and that was, you know, pre-G-Line or Gold Line, and, and Candela's wasn't built out yet, and so 
what, so the, that was the direction that staff right. had gotten at the time. And this, because I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but we wanted to be broader in terms of the, okay. the whereas statements, because at the end of the day, it's going to be the, the, the people that sit up there that are going to make the decision um, okay. based on okay. the merits of the plan. Okay, good. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think that's the right route to go on to this because I think it, you know, these are the residents who live there who are going to pay for this stuff. So yep. whether, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be up to us to decide whether this is regionally significant enough for us to allow this or not. It ought to be, you know, the, the buyers get to decide whether this is something they want to do or not. So let me move on to then the, 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 the ability to the city to add mills for either this, you know, development paying its own way or an ongoing, ongoing, you know, uh, items. Um, I worry about that a little bit. I worry about us. I, I'm glad our ordinance allows that. Um, I, and, and maybe there's not a practical way to kind of put some limitations on that. I worry about not this city council, but city councils being really extractive of, of development and, and, you know, really reaching to connect things because in, in certain markets you can, you know, you can be, you can be really demanding. And so is there anything that can be contained within this ordinance that, that kind of puts some limitations on the city's ability to just extract from developers? Well, well at the end of the day, the extractions has to be- Is from the homeowners. Right. They need to be justified. And so when we work with our attorney partners in talking about that, they're going to be reviewing the service plan and they're going to saying, hey, are the, the bond attorneys going to be able to say that you've identified these regional improvements or whatever, that's, that's okay or that's not. So an example that Brian was talking about is that we've had some conversations with various metro districts about contributing pro rata share or some share out of bond issuance to the uh, railroad underpass mm -hmm. on Indiana Street. And um, for the most part, that has been a no-go zone for most of the councils that we've talked to relative to that ask because they're saying we can't make that connection um, enough. So there is checks and balances within our ability of what we're asking for in the legal and the bond community for what is okay or not. Um, so we have our provisions of saying it's need to be in the CIP, um, either funded or unfunded. Um, so we need to have identified that this is something that's important to us. And then we need to be working with the Metro District Board and their attorneys to say, this is our intent of what we are spending it on. So a good example of that is recently we received $3.8 million from JCMD um, out of their 2021 bond allocation, and we are putting it towards utility improvements um, uh, for the North Trunk Line and those types of things. You know, we, we could have put it towards um, water tank, we could have put it towards other things like that, but in an IGA, we agreed what those contributions were gonna go for. And we would expect in the future, if and when we identify which way we're gonna go, mills or something like that, we would also identify the parameters of how that money could be spent. Yeah. I guess I worry about just the bond bonding, you know, money lenders being the, uh, the limitation there, because you know, you take the, the developer and their goal is to get their development approved and you know the the, the bonding people you know for them it's got to be successful to be paid off in the end but 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 I hate for them to be the limitation because ultimately it's the residents who pay it and you know like as Mr. Pfeiffer says who's kind of who's kind of looking out for that limitation and maybe there's no way for us to for the city to kind of be that 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 kind of limitation but it seems a little bit of you know, it's like when you, it's like when you need a new roof on your house. If you just go hire a roofer, it's seven thousand dollars. But if your insurance is replacing it, it's twenty thousand dollars. You know, and then you get a third, the third party where each party has different goals. So, um, I don't yeah, know I think that's a completely that. fair argument. And it wouldn't just be the bond financial side of things; it would also be the legal side as well, um, in conjunction with city council, in conjunction with our plan. I mean. Ultimately, hopefully, having that many people looking at it, we don't get to that point that you're bringing up. But right. I could, 
we can certainly see the argument. And when we discussed even making it a possibility, we, we certainly were challenged with that same concern. Right, right. OK. I particularly, oh, go ahead. On the model IGA that's in your packets, it's got an exhibit, and it's blank, so it really means nothing to you right now. But when you're negotiating the model, the model service plan, you're going to identify what these regional improvements are going to be. Sure. So you're going to have a pretty good idea of what you want that portion of the money to go to. And then y you, as the council, is gonna, are going to decide, do we want to make them pay the one mill? Do we want to make them pay a lump sum? Yeah. Do we want to continue it? Yeah. But, 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 I, but I guess, where, I guess my, my problem here is, is that I worry about cities because we're in a p powerful position here being extractive. Right. And, and, and us just so going for what, whatever we can get through the bond people, essentially, because that becomes the limit, limiting factor is what we can get through the, through the money lending side. Because the developers likely are going to say, hey, if it gets my project approved, well, I'm fine. And of course, we're talking about for residents who aren't even here yet. So, right. so we're looking out for people who don't, fa they're faceless and we don't exist. And I, you know, I think this topic on metro districts, I think, as you can tell by this discussion, is, is, is difficult to understand. It's, uncompli it's complicated and it's, it's something that none of us have a lot of experience with because we don't have a lot of metro districts. And so, you know, us sitting in that seat of being the limiting factor when we have all these desires for, you know, fixing our traffic system and, yeah. and bike, bike and pedestrian pathway network and park network and, you know, it, 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 the, the list is about as long as your leg of things that we could deem to be regionally significant infrastructure. And, I don't know that we always can be trusted to be the limitation either, is, is I guess where I'm going with that, yeah. so. I actually uh, want to second Mr. Marriott's comment on that. Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm not deeply familiar with Metro districts. There aren't any in District 2. This isn't an issue I have to face very often except for the times like this when it's coming before me because we speak for the whole city. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I care deeply about the residents of District 4 where the majority of these are and some in 3. But at, at the same time, I don't know if I could be the expert to go, well, wait a second, this looks like a little bit of a shell game going on. I, I'm not qualified to be that expert, and I'll just be honest and own that. It's not something that faces my constituents deeply. And so what happens when somebody comes in um, potentially down the line, and they're really not as concerned with the residents, they're only concerned about that vot their voters, and that's something we have to always be wary of in, in politics is, what is the nature because you know sometimes people are very concerned about what's in front of them and not the larger picture so i, I agree with mr marriott that gives me pause as well okay let me uh, let me just finish my last uh comment here and that's i, I do want to say one thing positive about metro district especially metro district versus hoa um, i recently got to go on a bus tour of some new developments in and around the whole metro area and it was, it was pretty illustrative you know, we already have Candela's built out and that's kind of our biggest, last biggest, you know, kind of greenfield development. So we may be facing a little bit different future, but I did see and we did look at um, different projects where uh, Metro districts built these kind of enhancements to these communities, things you might not find. One of them has a, a coffee shop that was better than the best Starbucks you've ever been to. And it's, you know, a community asset that the residents of the community own and looks like it's tremendously supported and really a positive and really kind of a thinking outside the box. It's certainly not regionally significant infrastructure or any, anything like that. And so it was, it was quite a positive to see some of the things that are possible with metro districts when, when they're allowed and when we allow some creativity with metro districts and not look at metro districts as a benefit for for the city for for us to be able to you know another vehicle for us to be able to get stuff so I was I was struck by that and and I had several conversations with people about this kind of metro district issue and HOA issue and and I did want to bring up one thing and that's the at least one of the benefits to metro districts are they're a special district they're governed by the laws in in, in Colorado and we have as a city, we have some enforcement ability for, to enforcing the service plan that we approve versus if an HOA were to take on some of these things. So you take the example of a pool or any kind of an enhancement. 
you know, HOAs retain the legal ability to put special assessments on residents, things like that, that might be really outside of a Metro District Service Plan that the city really has no authority or ability to intervene at all. It's a purely civil transaction between, you know, an HOA or members of a community versus other members of the community. And so, uh, you know, with all these questions about metro districts and kind of our, our grappling with trying to understand them, I, I think we're missing maybe some of what can be really positive about it. And I, I would suggest, I'd love to see, you know, with this next step slide here, I don't know how, or how we can do it and how we can, you know, meet these schedules to do it, but, but I would love to see maybe a little bit of a broader educational uh, understanding of not just the specifics of this metro district ordinance that we're doing, but, but, but metro districts in general, some of the case studies or examples or, you know, things, things of where they've been successful and where they haven't been successful. I mean, the Denver Post famously wrote an article talking about some of the unsuccessful things in the metro district world. None of it involved anything in Arvada or anything even close to the situations we have here. But I, would, I guess I would like to know more before going forward with this, although I can say from my reading of the ordinance and reading of the model service plan and your presentation tonight and this discussion tonight, um, you know, I think, I think we're on the right track. I think we're doing the right thing with, with our ordinance, but it's an uncomfortable thing to be acting on given the complexity of the subject and the, and the infrequency at which we deal with it to, to really feel solid in here's the decision I'm making and why. So I don't know if we have any opportunities to enhance our ability here. Well, we can, we can certainly talk about it, but I want to kind of um, speak to that point and also the uh, point that Council Member Simpson um, raised as well. And, and it's specifically towards what, what are we looking at with this ordinance? And this is an enabling ordinance. This is not us advocating for metro districts, saying that they're a good thing, that they're a bad thing. This is so that we have the systems in place so that should somebody from the private sector come to us and ask us for these things, these are the guardrails that we're putting around. So what I can say is that to date, our analysis and review of our current ordinance, ordinance is that it's outdated and that we have been actually pushing back people that are asking us to issue service plans or, or do under our current um, on our current ordinance um, because we don't think that it goes far enough. We think that the parameters in this ordinance um, are, bring us up to speed with where we need to be for that transparency piece, for the debt limitations, for some of the accountability pieces. And so that's what we're trying to do with this ordinance. Now, in talking to some of those things about the education piece, about what could be done, um, and, and just awareness, so perhaps you know what better questions to ask when a service plan is in front of you of saying like, are you only building roads or this, or are you building a coffee shop or whatever, or, or what are those limitations? We could certainly, you know, um, bring a workshop back and talk about, you know, what is possible within metro districts. I don't want to say there, that, that that is mutually exclusive from this. I don't think that any of that information would necessarily change anything in the ordinance um, because we wouldn't be that specific to say you need to do something that you know really enhances or goes a bit beyond because each community is going to make that decision for themselves so we can certainly bring that information back but the goal is to have a solid ordinance so that you can trust it to know that you have the guardrails in front because it's not something that you do all the time and it is an extremely complicated um, issue all right mr. Fiverr thank you and I agree. I think more education. I agree with uh, Marriott on that. I think that we should know the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, you know, obviously, I'm highlighting where I think there are some pitfalls. Um, I don't know the questions asked. You know, I approve some of these metro districts. And I think the intent, let's just go back to the original conversations. I remember very clearly, I could probably name all the developers sitting in front of us that said, hey, if we do it this way, it's a tax write-off to the folks that, you know, you can write your taxes off on this at one point. Well, that was retracted, and you didn't get to write it off. And so we thought, hey, it's better than paying an HOA because you can't write that off, but you can write off your taxes on it. Well, that went out the window. So now you, you, there was no, you know, at the time, the risk on the citizen was minimized because we thought they could write it off. Um, but they can't now. And so I think that... Uh, 
we need to be a little bit more aware of what is going on um, with, with these metro districts and we need to be very clear. I think the service plans are great uh, for that moment in time. My issue that I have with the service plans is I don't think we solve everything. Did you have some more you want to add? Well, it's limited to 10000 You can write them off. It's just limited to $10,000. In conjunction with your state income tax. That's what we're Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's probably more <laughs> to that than, than just that. But um, so here, here's where I struggle with it. I think when we were first did Metro Districts, I agreed the intent, the reason, pay for your own growth. I think all of that makes sense to me. I think what, what we're dealing with now is now that we've got 16 of them, we are now dealing with citizens that have bought houses, rooftops are done, they're in their place, and now we're starting to see like all these blind spots in the conversation. What happens here is we sit here, we talk about a service plan that could be limited, we approve it, we launch it, and we have no accountability. There's nothing we can do to that group anymore because now they're their own government entity other than hold them to a service plan. Complaints going to DOLA, it's like DOLA coming and telling us we're doing our job wrong. That's not going to happen. So there is nobody to complain. So the first four years, it's developer driven. So the only person who is running this is developers who the people are going to complain to that they have no other way than to possibly do a re-election or an election. And at that point, I'm still not sure how the Candelas elections happen on Beaumont Cimarron. I need to dig deeper into that and more education. but. That's a good decade that was there that developers sat on that board. Um, because I remember the ribbon cutting down at that pool. I think you were even there, Mayor. Mm. And there was all just grasslands. And they just got citizens put on that board a year or two ago when that ribbon cutting was nine years ago. So something didn't work right. Something did not get the citizens engaged. There's 5,000 residents out there, people. And you couldn't get two people to run or three people to run. I, so I just need to make sure that we have some guardrails around that part. I, I struggle with that process. There has to be something there we can change. Because if we're working, worrying about election, so it's cheaper for a developer to put it on an election in November or a May election, why? You know, why is that so important? And then why can't we have, what can we do within the state laws that allow some more accountability than just all developers sitting on a, because the developers, are, the board is made up of a developer, the investor, right? The capital investors usually sitting on it. Um, and they're just interested in what kind of money that they can pay, pay, uh, piggyback onto the, the future residents. I worry the gap between when we approve here and the time that residents get on that board is a void in accountability. There is nothing in that era, and that's other than the service plan, can we deal with? How, how can we fix that? How can we make ourselves feel more comfortable with that? What are you asking for, Councilmember Pfeiffer? Well, I mean, because you have a board, you have a board that's made up of the people that are spending the money. There is nobody there representing the future residents on that board or holding them accountable other than the service plan, which I'll give you an example that chops my hide. I'll use this one as a good example. They opened up clubhouses in Candelas, which is part of the plan. Uh, they opened them up before rooftops were out there. They acquired a couple million dollars worth of debt. The investor who's on the board, which I think is a conflict of interest, turns around and lends the money to the same people that are building the building that are on the board too, to go and build the clubhouses but yet there's no revenue rooftops to pay for it and then turn around and say, well, hey, Bob, I'm going to charge you 9% on that two, three million I gave you. By the time the residents start paying it back, it's going to be compounding and now it's at $6 million or $5 million. And there was nobody in there. There's no accountability. If there is a conflict of interest, that was it. And yet we are okay sitting here allowing people to get elected to have no, no accountability for, for a conflict of interest. Now, Bob, I think that one has been highlighted in, in some of the Denver Post articles that, and others. But that happened so, in Candelas. But, okay. So, but let me push back just a little bit that, and particularly with what we're talking about doing going forward in terms of the transparency of what this is going to cost, you know, I still believe in the free market system and if prices get too expensive, people aren't going to buy the houses. And so that's the pushback that will hopefully 
cause them to self-regulate a little bit. Yeah, but it, when I go in, like my example, if I'm buying a house at seven hundred thousand, yes, I yes, and then I have a fifteen thousand annual dollar bill when everyone else pays two or three thousand in the city, that's a ten grand extra. Well, that's for where these the next additional 40 disclosures, years. I think, are going to help address that. That I, it's going to say, you know, hey, let's not go so high on on these mill levies that. People are going to be scared off from buying that property. Well, the limit the limit of 60 mills, I think, is what they're putting here. 10 for operating, 50 for capital debt or debt. So 60 versus what you know some folks have, 77. As you see, the debt was Candelas's. Uh, the highest debt payback is, is well, the, the one that really well blew total we, is was hometown south. Hometown south, which of course some of us pay or did. You live in hometown South? No, no, I'm saying oh. that's the development that the developer did not want me to preside over. So <laughs> yes. Yes. I would have been a no vote. <laughs> yes. So I just, I don't know if, I, maybe like, uh, maybe what I'm hearing is, is or to myself, is just more education on how this ordinance will address those fears. You, you need to help me get there. And I'm not sure we're going to get it out of this workshop. That's why I go back to what John was saying, is maybe more education of understanding that. And this has to be something that, future councils have to be educated on because they're making a decision to create a government that they cannot hold accountable other than the service plan. There is no repercussion. I get complaints from residents out west of who do they complain to about the board. And really all I can say is DOLA. Yeah. And guess what, DOLA is like, I can't do anything for you. But Bob, I think the only thing I would say is I think what you're talking about, about that gap and all that, you know, that's all contained within state law and that's really, that's really where the where the remedy or where if there needs to be changes ought to be is is the, the legislature needs to take these things on. I don't know that we have the jurisdiction to be able to create special special district rules within just within our area of jurisdiction. In lieu of our government, I would say no to every metro district coming in front of. If our, if our, they can't do it and we can't figure out a way to work within the the statutes and create more safeguards that make us feel more comfortable, then maybe we shouldn't be doing these. So let's let the team go back with the attorney and, uh, and figure out what, what kind of safeguards that we can do that's within state statute that it gives us our local control abilities that we can put some things around it to feel a little bit better. Otherwise, I have to say I'm, I'm not for these, these metro districts. I don't think you guys, until your checkbook is writing those out and you're hearing the complaint and the confusion by the citizens, I'll be more than happy to point them all to you <laughs> so that you can hear the complaints about, I pay these taxes, why is my, why is my road bad? I pay the city $1,000 a month or $15,000 a month or $1,500 a month to the city. That's what they think. It's not. We have 4.21 mills is ours, something, four, 4 mills, a little over 4? 4.31. And, and that they don't understand. And so they think that government city county maybe is taking all of this and so why is it why are uh, you know why are my roads bad why are why are why aren't you snow plowing i think didn't everyone complain about why aren't all the roads snow plowed in candelas because they, they think they're paying this premium resort fee that every road should be plowed they we need to figure out how to get from from enabling what you're asking the developers enabling giving them the ability to do what they need to do within limits to the ability of rationalizing what folks are paying for. And I get the horse camp to the river, but unfortunately that's just government. We're just gonna have to continuously work on that to figure out how do we close every which way to teach folks that are buying into these properties. And now the problem is, is when people are buying into new properties, they know about the mill levies, but they don't understand, they think it's an HOA. They don't think it's a government. And it, it just, they don't understand why there's $180 million in debt. And so that's a different conversation when somebody's buying a house that's already been built. So I don't know how we can close it, but we can do probably a little bit better in this area the, and, and go from there. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just gonna say that I, I, I think all valid points, we can end up taking the, this information back. I, the education piece on it is important. Um, of course, not, not only as you're pointing out for council, but also the citizens. But I, I think that the, our intent with the ordinance and with the model service plan and IGA was to basically put guardrails on the uh, on that wildly crazy decision that could possibly be made that would be financially just reckless, and uh, and to but at the same time 
to give council an overwhelming amount of discretion so that every single project wasn't, it didn't have to be treated the exact same. So the, the, the reason that we placed the idea of the lump sum and then uh, the mill as an optional thing was just because there might be a circumstance that comes up that the only feasible way for council to approve it is for whatever that circumstance is, is to have both. But maybe 99% of the time, or maybe never, would you ever uh, actually require both. So this is one example. We're trying to build in flexibility. Flexibility is not as, as helpful if we're not, I guess, on the same uh, page as far as the possibilities of, of a special district. Now, I guess the only other thing that I was gonna say is we, we could definitely put together uh, and work on putting together some case studies or examples. I mean, there are metro districts that took advantage in the, in the time of wonderful interest rates to refinance their debt, not to kick it out, but to pay it off faster. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are, there are examples of metro districts certainly as a financing mechanism that are, that are to the advantage of homeowners, and it will, in the free market system, take that home price and not, uh, not have it as high. Uh, of course, it won't be low in this market, but it won't be as high if it's if it's built into an infrastructure that's being paid off over time. Could could we put any type in this ordinance that when and I'll have to look to our lawyer over here, where when you have so many rooftops created that you will you know just like a vacancy hearing from our side that if the first soon, soonest election available that they are to that's a municipal or a may that that they are to, you know, have a vacancy kind of election in a way and enforce uh, citizens to start being engaged early in the development versus after the development's done. So we can't force anybody to run no, for but, election. But you should, but I can tell you something happened where I think it, it didn't pull because I know there are some developers that actually get people on the board right away. Sure. And there's some that just absolutely don't. So how do we find the middle ground? Between so the, 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 in the transparency slide talks about some of the things in, in, within the ordinance is making sure you know when the elections are happening, how that notice happens. Those are the types of things that it at least gets the word out and makes sure that people are aware of it on that cycle so that people who are interested in running have that opportunity as soon as they are property owners. So could it be a, a welcome mailer that we tell the developer you have to put this packet information here, in? Here's, here's an example of something that we could do, is the city is interested in providing education to all citizens about metro districts, where they are, what their middle levels are. So the city could have um, its website, and then it connects to these websites that, that those things are. But on our own, as part of our, our VATA newsletter or things like that, we can push out when the elections are. We can direct people to the Metro District website of our thing. So there's ways that we can communicate about those in addition to it, even though it's not necessarily our responsibility, but it could be a form of communication that we choose to un undergo. So there are ways of doing it, but we have to follow the election schedule of the, of the process. So Rachel K, expect a little <laughs> more work for you. We're going to get a process in place, and then it's going to be automated, and we're just going to know, and it's going to be great. We're, we're repeatable, process-oriented people. Right. Um, but the other things that you brought up, though, I just I, I, I want to mention that you're, you're talking about are there other guardrails, and, and, and everything that you list, I actually really do think that Kim and her team was very thoughtful about those things, and I believe that those things are in the current draft of the ordinance. So take for example, we don't allow compound interest. We do require that a financial, an independent financial person that has to be paid for um, by the developer gives us a, an evaluation to saying that they're not gouging um, the developer or, and, or that, that they're not gouging the future residents, that the, um, the note that they're using is an appropriate note and something that could be um, found in the marketplace and those types of things. Um, that the de their debt goes away after 40 years, so it's not going in perpetuity that, you know, residents 60 years from now. There are a lot of those things where we put caps on the mill levy of 50 mills, but I also recall that we left the flexibility that if somebody came in here and gave you a compelling reason to go above 50, that council has that discretion as well. So our baseline state 
is 50 or below. But if council wanted to go above that, that's in the ordinance too. So there's a lot of discretion that you have, but the guardrails are pretty conservative as it relates to what we can do as a city to regulate these. Okay, I see no other questions. Mr. Mr. Devin, do you need anything further from us on this uh, topic tonight? Well, as, as always, we really appreciate the feedback. <laughs> Um, what I what I do I, I do believe that what has been presented tonight is an improvement over what we currently mm -hmm. have, and I would I think urge the city council to allow us to go forward um, and present uh, the um, uh, uh, ordinance on the plan that's been uh, presented here tonight. You always have if there's something that we missed or something that we catch later on, we always have the ability to amend the ordinance. But this is a step in the right direction that addresses the concerns that you all have expressed to us before. And if we can get this in place, I think we can build on it. Um, if, um, if we see uh, an area or an issue that we didn't fully address or didn't fully address to your liking as we, as we, as we bring these uh, service plans forward, we can always make a cha changes to it. Yeah, the only addition I would say to that, Mr. Devin, is that I'm hearing pretty loudly and clearly that we need more education on the pros and cons right. of metros. So we can decide whether or not to, you know, yes, we can get this ordinance in place that has some safeguards, but when we're actually viewing individual projects, you know, should we approve this one or not based upon further education? Yeah, we, we will, um, uh, we can certainly do our best to bring you additional information uh, to provide you with that information, that education that you're looking for. Uh, and I think our, our team's committed. This is, uh, you know, uh, both finance, uh, community economic development, and legal working together with outside uh, consultants. So we can, we can provide that additional information later. Right. But I think this is a discussion that we actually started a little over two years ago. And so I think bringing something forward now is, is, uh, is perhaps um, it's time to do that and, and take an affirmative step to improve what we have right now. Yeah, Mr. Fiber. Yeah, I did have one more question. Sorry. We're going to go back. Can we make sure there's no tiffs on top of all this? Because Candelas has a tiff on top of it that's causing some confusion. Yeah. So that's the, that's nor that's the <laughs> Northwest Urban Renewal Area of Aura. Which was approved by City Council. Yeah. So see, we get these weird things where we're like, oh, let's pr approve JCMD for their thing. Oh, by the way, we're going to do these subs. Oh, by the way, we're going to do a tiff. We probably never get a comprehensive, like, uh, expense uh, view into that and so that is also added confusion so maybe we yeah. can figure out how tips pop Oop. up on metro districts like that and then make the citizens pay for it when it's all residential yeah. so so let's just I did these are the things that well we'll, we'll, get, need to we'll, be get, you, we'll get you some additional information on that um, I, I believe that I believe state law actually does not allow that to happen. Again, uh, Jefferson County Treasurer kept yeah. the money, so yeah. he had we'll, a we'll, better on it. We'll get you some more information on that. Yeah, and that would be good. So I, I, I think you're right. We're going the right direction. I agree with the mayor that we probably can have more uh, movement on the, the ordinance. Um, but as the individual metro districts come up, we probably need to be well educated on, on them. And then we need to have eyes wide open and not compound problems. So thank you, Mayor, for letting me chat for one more minute. Okay. I see no further lights. I will recognize no further lights. <laughs> Mr. Devin, do you have anything else? No. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Good discussion. <laughs>